Now, on Radio 4, it's time for Saturday Night Theatre. Now the door is open, now burns the flame of ecstasy. Come with me, your father, into the oneness of the spirit. Let go your hold on earth. Exercise yours. Now you, our chosen vessel, must drink of the flaming cup. I am one, and I am all. I give you the wine of ecstasy, and may it bring you joy and bother and in soul. In me, drink, drink. Nio Marsh, adapted for radio by John Tideman, with Peter Howell as Chief Detective Inspector Elaine and Gary Watson as Nigel Bathgate. Death in Ecstasy. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it, Father Garnet. The lady is dead. But oh. Dr. Kelsey... Oh, I told you she was dead. I told you. I, I touched her. Be quiet, Miss Wade. This is terrible, terrible. I think the sort of thing could happen in the house of the sacred flame, on the very steps of the holy altar. Oh, it's terrible. Father Garnet, I really do think you should get rid of the rest of the congregation. I think you should. You should tell them to go. Wait a minute. Oh. What? I'd just like to ask you, Doctor, whether this lady died naturally. Well, I've only had time to establish the fact of death as to its cause. But have you any doubt as to the cause of death? What do you mean, and who are you, anyone? I just happen to be in the congregation. But how? This is a private sect. There is a guard on the door. He has strict orders not to admit strangers. Let's just say the guard lowered his guard and I slipped in out of the rain. Monstrous. Look, I'm sorry to be here and I'm sorry to interfere, but I'd just like to say that if there's any suspicion of unnatural death, then I believe no one unnatural should Unnatural be... death? Where'd you get that idea? Well, I'd say the manner of the lady's death. The mouth, the eyes. Now, I may be wrong, but if there's any doubt, then I don't think any of the principal participants, that's to say, all of you in the vestry here, the, the, the six... Um... Uh, in this year, th- we were... Seven. Yes, the six of you, and the two young... Um... Oh, if you mean Lionel and me, we're... Yes, we're acolytes. We hope Father Garnet... We, we... Uh, yes. Yes, well, all of you, and Father Garnet, of course, I think you should stay. I think you're right. But, Doctor... No, I'm afraid I must agree with this young man. But, Doctor... You can yes, dismiss I, I... those out there. The door guard keeps a list of those attending, and should there be any need for witnesses... Witnesses? Not allowed to leave unnatural causes. What is all this? Morris, be no, quiet. No, I won't, Jane. That woman had no business to be here. She had no right to the cup. She was evil. Oh, oh, I God, know, I Father Garnet, I know. Shut up, Pringle. I remember where you are. We, we, we know God. I was unhappy and unpopular. But really, Mr. Pringle, there's only a curtain dividing us from those in the temple over there. We don't want them to hear us, do we? We can soon remedy that. Come, Lionel. Yes, Father. Good. Yes, Father. Draw the curtain. Support me to the pulpit. We will bless and dismiss the flock. Excuse me whilst I return to my people. Yes, yes, Father. yes Father. Now lead the way. Yes, yes Father. Father. Oh, isn't he marvellous? Well, Doctor, what is it? Poison? It looks like it, I'm afraid. Death was instantaneous. We must inform the police. Is there a telephone? Yes, there's one through there in Father Garnet's rooms. His rooms? Yes, he lives here, behind the altar. Then shall I make the call? I happen to know a man at the yard. It might be easier. Yes, I'll... by all means, but slip out quietly. We don't want to alarm anyone any further. Right, right you are, oh, Doctor. Uh, uh, will he be all right, Doctor? I'm so worried about him. Who? Oh, my father, Garnet, of course. The shock, the strain, the, this awful thing. I'm sure he'll never be himself again. And so, my people, I ask you to believe that the choice of the rushing powers of endless space has fallen on our beloved sister in ecstasy, Carla Quay. Meditate upon the word, Unica. Strengthen your souls for the power of the word. Oh, hello. Uh, could I have a word with Chief Detective Inspector Alain, please? Speaking? Oh, it's you. You're in, then. Of course. It's Nigel Bathgate speaking. I know. What's the matter? Well, I'm speaking from the House of the Sacred Flame in Knock Latch's Row, uh, not far from my flat. My division, yes. A woman died here about ten minutes ago. I think you'd better come. It's all very suspicious. Are you trying to say it's murder? Oh, why should I know? Why did you ring the yard? Well, I thought you'd prefer the personal touch. And you thought I wouldn't be so disapproving of you 
writing the thing up for one of your beastly newspapers. <laughs> How did you guess? All right, I'll be round in a few moments. Oh, and Bathgate. Yeah? Keep calm. I'm calm enough. But you should see the converted on the other side of that door. They're a pretty rum lot, I can tell you. And Bathgate. Yes? Keep your ears open, there's a good fellow. Goodbye. Goodbye. Keep your ears open. Cheek. He's kept the congregation quiet. He's kept us quiet. What are we to believe of our precious father? What are you talking about? Oh, you about? know well enough, Mrs. Candor. Oh. You'd have taken Cara's place if you could have. It's not his fault, it's yours. Now, Morris. No, I... Jenny, I will say it. It's all such a farce. But whatever's behind it, I know it's retribution. I know, I know, I know. Extremely unusual sort of church, I must say. Yes, I think the whole thing owes something to early German and Scandinavian cults. Well, whatever it is, I don't like it. It's a beastly place, and I can't think what brought you into it, Bathgate. I told you I was bored and saw the sign outside swinging in the rain. I suppose I came in search of adventure. And I suppose that with your habitual naivety, you consider that you found it. Ah, oh, Inspector Fox, I take it you've got all the details of the immediate witnesses? Yes, sir. And the doorkeeper was good enough to provide a list of those in the congregation. Good. And you've asked these how many? Nine people, sir. You've asked them to wait? Yes, sir. In the vestry, if that's what they call it here. They're a rum crowd, sir. They'd need to be to get involved in a place like this. Is it murder? The lady died of a good strong dose of cyanide, yes. We've got to wait for the autopsy, of course. But our divisional surgeon, Cassius, backed up your opinions, Dr. Kasbeck. He also agrees that you did all you could under the circumstances. I would have tried artificial respiration and so on, but she was dead before I got to her. Only took a matter of seconds. The first thing I noticed was the characteristic odor. That chalice thing stinks of it. Bailey's going over it for fingerprints there. It's not much help if they all handled it. Oh, yes, they passed it round all right. I, I suppose it must have been the climax of the ceremony when Miss Quain got it. A, a silver jug holding the wine was handed in turn to each of them, and each poured a little into the cup. The priest gave it to her, she drank, and fell down, dead. We've looked at the silver jug, and there doesn't seem to be anything odd about it. Still, we'll have the wine in it analysed. But let's get a clear picture of the routine. As I understand it, Miss Quain was the chosen vessel, and she stood in the middle while the others knelt round her. Garnet gave the cup to one of the acolytes. Yes, Claude. Then this Claude person passed his hand over the cup, and up jumped a flame. A drop of methylated spirits, perhaps. I suppose, sir. Then the cup was passed from hand to hand by the kneeling circle of six, and each took the jug from pretty boy Claude and poured some wine into the cup. Yes, the idea is that the initiates all symbolize some sort of deity. So the cup went round the circle, and when it got to the last person, what happened? He handed it back to the priest. Oh, it was a man, was it? Yes, Mr. Ogden, the American gentleman. And then the priest, Garnet, handed the cup to Miss Quain, and she drank it. Yes, she drank it, poor thing. I suppose there's no chance that Miss Quain herself could have dropped anything into the cup. Oh, no. I'm, I'm sure of it. She held the cup by the stem with both hands. It looked so odd that I remember it distinctly. Yes, Mr. Bathgate's quite right. Tell me, how is a man like you connected with all this, Dr. Kasbeck? Well, I'm not a member of the sect or anything. <laughs> I'm just an onlooker, if you like. Garnet's doctrines amused and intrigued me. So did the man himself. He has some strange sort of hold over people. Hypnotism, perhaps. Where did the money come from? It looks a pretty expensive sort of setup. Subscriptions, I suppose. Also donations and legacies. Ogden will be able to tell you. He's Grand Warden or something, and I believe he looks after the practical side of things. And the service tonight, was that ritual a very frequent sort of event? Oh, no, that's the star turn. It's only held once a month, and the chosen vessel has to do a month's intensive instruction and meditation with the priest. So Cara Quain spent her last month on Earth largely in Mr. Garnet's company. I imagine, sir. That altogether envy her. Well, Dr. Kasdek, you've been most helpful, and I won't keep you any longer. You'll be subpoenaed for the inquest, of course. Of course. Well, it looks like being an interesting case, Inspector. Yes, but I don't like the look of it, I must confess. But then we policemen are always supposed to say that, aren't we? Yes, and you always do. Well, good night, Dr. Kasdek. There's a constable on duty at the door, but he's been told to let you out. Good. Well, good night, Mr. Bathgate, and thank you for your sensible assistance. Think nothing of it, Doctor. All part of the job. Good night, Inspector. Um, what about me? Will your tame constable at the door let me go? If you want to. Oh, but you don't want to, do you? No. Then stay. You can take notes, but no releasing the story until I give you the go-ahead. Okay. Uh, what next? What do you think? We recapitulate? Later. We interview the witnesses. Precisely. You've got the list, Fox? Yes, sir, it is. Uh-huh. I know we're in a place of worship, Fox, but let the first be first. Father Garnet? I prefer to call him Mr. Garnet. Yes, Fox, bring in the priest. Let's see if he's got anything to confess. Pretty good, sir. 
What are your impressions, Bart, get the names on this list? Ah, oh, that'll be telling. Well, then tell. <laughs> well, you know what I think about the two acolytes, Lionel and Claude. I see from Fox's notes that Lionel is a dancer in a West End show and Claude is a lady's hairdresser. It's very much in character. They also share the same address. Hot house plants, the pair of them. Yeah. Mrs. Candor. Not so candid as her name would suggest, not quite as grand as she liked to appear. Mr. Ogden seems like the original cliched American. <laughs> a sort of middle-aged gentleman who beams from the advertising pages of transatlantic periodicals. A bit too good to be true, perhaps. Then there's Janie Jenkins. Well, I think she should be taken with Maurice Sprinkle. I, I don't know if they're engaged, but they might be. She seems worried about him somehow. What do you mean? Well, she seems afraid that he might break out suddenly, you know, do something, say something wild. He's a bit odd, excitable, not like Miss Wade. Though I suspect she's not quite the little old spinster she appears to be. Quite waspish at times. And Monsieur Rao Honoré Christophe Gérard de Ravine? French. So it would seem. A quiet gentleman, something of a collector, I believe. Closely connected with the deceased. Possibly uh, an affair. Um, who does that leave us with? Number one. Ah, yes. And Father Garnet is certainly interested in number one. He's clever. Clever, but bogus. And as the bard says, he speaks not like a man of God's making. Therefore, <laughs> the fall of my office happened, Inspector... Uh, uh, Chief Detective Inspector Allen. Ah, Allen. Uh, stay with us, Fox. Mr. Bathgate may need some help with his shorthand. Very good, sir. What unseen power has struck down this dear soul in the very moment of spiritual ecstasy? Cyanide of potassium, we think. But there's a poison. One of the deadliest. Then you mean... That murder has been done. Now, that'll be for a jury to decide. There will be an inquest, of course. In the meantime, there are one or two questions which I should like to ask you. I needn't remind you that you are not obliged to answer them. I simply wish to do my duty. Excellent. How long has the deceased been a member of your congregation? She first came about 18 months ago and has since been a regular attendant, finally attaining the highest rank. Of chosen vessel? Precisely. While she was preparing for this, you saw a great deal of Miss Quain. Was she in any way depressed or troubled about anything? On the contrary. She was in a state of tranquility and joy. No worries about money? No. She was what the world calls rich. What do you call it? <laughs> I should call her rich too, Inspector. Any unhappy love affair that you know of? Carrie Crane was not concerned with earthly love. She was on the threshold of a new spiritual life. And she's now crossed that threshold. Mr. Garnet, do you know anything that can throw any light on this matter? Nothing. Nothing I can think of, that is. Don't think me impertinent, but how do you support this place? By subscriptions? My people welcome as a privilege the right to share in the hospitality of the sacred place. You mean they pay the running expenses? Yes. Was Miss Quain a generous supporter? She was. Where does the wine you use in the ceremony come from? Harrods. It is an invalid port. And do you yourself decant it? I mean, pour it into that silver flagon. This evening, the acolyte made the preparation. Ah, which acolyte? Claude. Having filled the flagon, he makes ready the goblet. You mean he places methylated spirits in the cup? Uh, in tabloid form. It is necessary, but quite holy. It has been blessed at the altar. Naturally. And how is the flame made to appear as you pass your hands over the cup? I, uh, I employ a little capsule. Really? What does it contain? I believe the substance is known as zinc, uh, F. Very ingenious. You turn away for a moment as you use it, perhaps. That is so. Well, it all seems quite clear now. One more question. Has that your knowledge ever been any form of poison kept on these premises? No, definitely not. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate your courtesy in answering so readily. There is just one other thing I must ask of you. Uh oh. I trust you have no objection to being searched. It's pure routine, but something to which I must ask all of you to subject yourselves. No, uh, no, I have no objection. Good. And afterwards, you'll no doubt be glad to change into less ceremonial dress. Afterwards, I shall avail myself of the opportunity to devote myself to meditation. In that way, in all humility, I believe I may be able to flow to you and help you in your task. You are a very, very receptive vessel. Only to facts, Mr. Garnet. I receive facts as a spider does fly. I'm afraid that I felt so absolutely ghastly. I just had to ask your nice officer if I could come on ahead of the others. What upset you, Mr. Wheatley? Oh, you can call me Claude. Lionel, I believe, in using Christian names. Got so much more appalling. What upset you, Mr. Wheatley? Oh, that appalling old woman. Whom do you mean? Why, the Candor female. What did she say? She accused me 
Of what? Of doing something to the wine. Of killing Cara. And did you? Of course not. Oh, Cara was a marvellous person. So simpatico. Not like that jealous old cat. Mrs. Cundin. Oh, yes, she's jealous of everyone. Especially when Father Garnet takes the slightest notice of anybody else. She hated Cara. Because she and Mr. Garnet saw so much of each other during the last month. Oh, uh, before that even. Uh-huh. Uh, you were serving the wine tonight? Yes. When you got it from Mr. Garnet's room, was it uncorked? Oh, no, it's always a fresh bottle. And apart from a methylated tablet, you didn't put anything into the goblet? No. And the flagon, when you decanted it, did you put anything else in the wine? Well, well, I didn't put any poison in it, if that's what you're hinting. What else did you put in? Oh, just something from a little bottle Father Garnet keeps in his cupboard. It has a ceremonial significance. It's always done. Have you any idea what it is? No, I've no idea. I see. Did you notice Miss Quayne at all when she took the cup? Oh, my God, yes. It was appalling. You see, I thought she was in blessed ecstasy. Well, I mean, she was, up to the time she took the cup. But there, oh, it was frightful. She gave a gasp, made a horrible face, dropped the cup and fell down with a terrible sort of jerking. Oh, it made me feel quite sick. Your friend Claude Wheatley's already been made sick just by telling the story. Oh, oh Claude's always so sensitive. Now, tell me, Mr. Smith. Lionel, uh, Claude and I always believe in using Christian names. It's got so much more rapport. Tell me, Mr. Smith, did you notice any unusual sort of smell when the wine had been poured? Smell? Smell? Unusual smell. Well, I wouldn't, would I? You see, I was sensing. What? Uh, swinging my sensor. Don't you think our incense is rather divine, Inspector? Father Garnet gets it specially from India. It's sweet. Almond blossom. Almond. Damn. Don't you like it? Very nice. Very useful. Well, thank you, Mr. Smith. I think your friend Claude is waiting for you, so after you've been searched, you can take him home. Search? Yes, by the constable over there. Oh, the tall young one. Yes. Do you mind? No, of course not. I don't mind at all. I don't in the least mind telling him what I think. I think Cara's death was a judgment. A judgment, Mrs. Candor? But what had she done to deserve such a terrible punishment? Cara was a very, a very passionate sort of woman. I know that Father Garnet is above all that kind of thing, but, uh, well, in my opinion, Cara was a dreadfully over -sex. She was a very beautiful woman, I believe. Well, I could never see it. Monsieur de Ravine went silly over her, but then you know what these foreigners are like. Anyway, Cara doesn't look so pretty now. No, Mrs. Candor, she doesn't. But then death by poisoning isn't altogether a pretty thing. Oh, oh, oh that was a beastly thing for me to say. It's, it's just that I'm so upset. Poor, poor Cara. I don't know how I'm going to get over this. I'm so sensitive, you see. But you, Inspector Elaine, you've been so very kind. I, I always thought police methods would be rather... Well, I must congratulate myself on sitting right next to the works for an inside survey of British investigation methods. This isn't a game, Mr. Ogden. Somebody has died. If you mean murder, why don't you say so? Oh, we must wait for the inquest before I can say that quite categorically. Well, if it is murder and the trail's not just all that easy and... Uh, oh, hell, uh, we're men of the world, Chief. I've got all the dollars. Mr. Ogden, I suggest we ignore what I believe you are suggesting. Well, we're trying to help. You would help us most by answering our questions. Now, tell me, did you notice an unusual smell during the ceremony? Oh, I can't say I did. Ah. Mr. Ogden, you were the last of the six initiates to handle the cup before it was passed back to the priest. That's correct. And he then handed it to Miss Quain, who drank it and... And we know what followed, Chief. Yes. I take it you're a businessman, Mr. Ogden. I have certain mining interests. You're also an officer of this sect. That's all the warden. I've worked out the business side of things since its foundation. I helped found it, if you like, about two years ago. I met Father Grant on the boat coming over to England, and he impressed me right away. By the time we reached Southampton, we have mapped out a scheme for this church, and within six months we were drawing congregations of about 300 souls. And the money, the financial support, where did that come from? Well, I dipped in five grand, I'm proud to say, and the father pulled in the rest with his high-voltage oratory. But who were the really big subscribers? Well, the Ravine checked in at a pretty high level, but Dagmar Candor and poor Cara came out tops with a thousand pounds each. They seemed somehow ambitious to carry off the generosity stakes. But Cara took a long leap ahead last month. Oh, how's that? She deposited 5,000 sterling in bearer bonds in the safe back there beyond the altar. They'll have to wait there until the five grand is raised among the rest of us, and there's the formal building fund for a new church. Very generous of her. She was a very generous and very lovely person. I understand that Monsieur de la Vigne thought so, too. Oh, he was crazy about her, crazy. Yet I gather the initiates were supposed to be a cut above mere earthly love. Yes, well, I guess de Ravine is not altogether cast off the shackles of the body, but... 
Get this. Kara was not interested. No, sir. It was the inner mysteries of the spirit that her soul was yearning after. The inner mysteries. Well, let's talk about the inner mysteries of the spirit and so on. Must sound pretty bogus to you, Inspector. Just a trifle, Miss Jenkins, I must confess. But there is something in it, you know. At least I thought so. Thought? No, I'm not so sure. Because of what's just happened? No. Oh, all this has shown us up in a pretty unattractive light, of course, but it's just... Well, just I've got my doubts about it. In fact, have had my doubts for some time. How long have you been coming here? About six months. Morris first brought me. Mr. Pringle? Yes, we're engaged, you see. Morris was so keen on it, he could talk of nothing else. He's awfully highly strung and, well, sort of vulnerable, so I thought... You thought you'd keep an eye on him, Miss Jenkins? Mm. I'd like you to tell me something that mightn't be easy to answer. Oh? Before I arrived, I gather Mr. Pringle said that Mr. Garnet was keeping everyone quiet, that Mrs. Candy would gladly have taken Miss Quain's place, and that he, your fiancé, knew something which he had to tell. Now, what did he mean by all that? I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Bathgate heard him, and the others claim to have heard him as well. Whatever he meant, it has nothing to do with this dreadful thing, I'm sure of it. You can't say that, Miss Jenkins. Whatever was in that cup poisoned an innocent woman. Now, you must surely see that the interrelationship of all of you is vitally important. There's only one person who can say what has no bearing on the case. A guilty person, you mean? I do, if one exists. All I can say is that Morris Hero worshipped Father Garnet. The father seemed to have some sort of hold over him, a hold over his imagination. Well, some of the women, Cara and Mrs. Candor, for instance, seemed so blatantly doting that Morris became suspicious that something rather... Well, rather worldly was going on in the background. He meant that Mrs. Candor was jealous of Miss Quain and that Garnet had kept it quiet. Yes, but don't think he meant that Mrs. Candor was so jealous that she... She... Oh, please don't think that. I shall keep an open mind, Miss Jenkins, I promise you. After you've been searched, you'll be free to go. We'll call a taxi for you, if you like. No, I'd rather wait until you've seen Morris, if you don't mind, Inspector. You tell him I'm waiting for him, won't you? He'll only worry otherwise. And your fiancé said you're not to worry, Mr. Pringle. She'll wait for you. Poor Janie. Mr. Pringle, what do you mean by retribution? What do you mean? You said earlier that Miss Quain's death was retribution. You also said that Mr. Garnet was keeping something quiet and that you knew something which you would tell to the world. That's my affair. I refuse to answer. Hey, good, Fox. Sir? Will you tell Miss Jenkins that Mr. Pringle doesn't wish to make a statement at the moment and there's no need for her to wait and see that she gets that taxi? Good, goes what on. do you mean? I'm taking her home. You I'm said... afraid I shall have to ask you to stay a little longer, Mr. Pringle. Oh, fishels. You win. Well, forget about the taxi, Fox. Very good, sir. Do you know anything about psychology, Mr. Pringle? Why? What are your views on crowd psychology, for instance? What do you think happens when people come under the sway of, shall we say, a magnetic preacher? What happens to them? <laughs> they become his slaves. Would you describe this congregation as Mr. Garnet's slaves? If you must know, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You say that very strongly. Of course I do, oh, for heaven's sake, Inspector. You're a detective, aren't you? You must have noticed. Look at my eyes. Yes, I had noticed, but I wanted you to tell me yourself that you were in the habit of taking drugs. Is this Mr. Garnet's doing? No. I, I mean, somebody gets them for him. He... He gave me a special cigarette, quite mild, really. He said it helped to make one receptive. No doubt. And it does. Only... Only... Only now it's more than mild cigarettes, isn't it? Stop it. Isn't it? Stop it. Janie doesn't know. Please don't tell her. Please. I won't if I can help it. What about the other initiates? Well, Cara Quain had begun. The candor was on it. That's all. Did you meet here together in Garnet's rooms and smoke your cigarettes? At first. Then uh, Mrs. Candor and Cara came at separate times. Then... When Cara was making her preparations for Chosen Vessel, she came alone. I see. No, you don't. You don't see at all. You don't know. Only I know. I saw them. Oh, oh, one afternoon, about three weeks ago, I came in to see him. There was no one here in the church. I went to his rooms, opened the door, and there they were. Father Garnet and the Chosen Vessel. So that is what you meant by retribution. Have you quite finished, Inspector? Yes, Miss Jenkins, quite finished. You may both go home now. Morris, Morris, darling, let's go. Oh, let me alone, Janie. But, darling, I want you to take me home. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, of course, I'm sorry. There we are. Take my arm. Uh, all right. Uh, all right, now. Inspector Allain, I could murder you for this. Oh, no, my child, don't talk like that, please. She was murdered, Monsieur Inspector. Whatever the inquest may say, I, Raoul Honoré Christophe Jérôme de Ravigne, know that. 
My Cara was murdered. You say my Cara. Am I to understand between you and Miss Quinn? But yes, I adore her. Many times I asked her to do me the honor of becoming my wife, but she was too devoted to the religious life. She was indifferent towards me. You are religious yourself, though, otherwise you wouldn't be here. True. This church, it's ceremonial, it intrigued me. Besides, I find one must have a faith. It is not in my temperament to be an atheist. When did you first attend services here? Uh, two years ago. I was one of the first to come here. I even gave a subscription to help the needs of the church. Oh, not a large amount. I'm not a rich man, you understand. Oh, I collect this and that object d'art, paintings, what my small resources permit. I envy you. Tell me, did Miss Quain uh, have no relations in England? There must be someone. No, nobody. Cara was an author. She was educated on the continent. In fact, it was in France that I first met her. At the house of some friends. And they lie. It was I who introduced her to the ceremonies here. So apart from her household, there is no one you can think of with whom we should get in touch. Well, there is a notary. Her solicitor? Yes. Now, his name. His name. It was Rats. Rats something. Ah, Bon. That is it. Rats is Bon. You know him? I know of him, certainly. As to the disposition of her estate, Mr. Baravina, have you any idea as to how Miss Quain intended leaving things? We did not talk of these matters. Though I do know this church will be a beneficiary, apart from the 5,000 pounds in bonds already reposed in the safe here. Cara told me once that she had altered her will for that purpose. It was then I heard of this Monsieur Ratti's book. Look, Monsieur Daravini, you said earlier that you were convinced that Miss Quinn had been murdered. Yes. But there is another possibility, an unlikely one, I confess. Suicide? Ah, no, a postique. Why should your car wish to die? She was beautiful, happy, in the prime of her life, and she was loved. And she was not poor. As you say, she was not poor. As you know, Inspector, rich people are not always to be envied. And Cara was rich. Of course, she was generous too, very generous. But she was not popular. And why was she not popular, do you think? Well, I think there was a, a certain amount of jealousy. On whose part? Ah, if I give you names, you might get suspicious and think all sorts of things. Jealousy is not invariably followed by homicide, Miss Wilkes. Oh, precisely. That's just what I've been saying. Mrs. Kander tells me that Miss Quain didn't have a very striking personality. Oh, that's not true. And it's very naughty of Dagmar to speak like that. Not as though Father Garnet gave her any encouragement. She's too noble and too pure even to guess. To guess what, Miss oh, oh, no, I... Uh... To, to guess what? Mm. Well, I, I don't believe what they say. Dagma Kander is very wicked to speak the way she does. Where was Mrs. Kander kneeling when you passed the cup to each other during the ceremony? Uh, she was um, first. And, and she passed the chalice to Monsieur de Ravine. Was there anything unusual in the way she handled the cup? Oh, no, not really. Uh, she poured in rather a lot of wine and was a little bit careless. Yes. She left a trickle on the rim. I noticed because Monsieur wiped it away with a spotless pocket handkerchief. He passed the cup to you, and you... I uh, passed it to Mr. Pringle. I almost had to hold it for him. He was shaking so much. Janey was next to him, and she simply had to take it from him or you would have dropped it. Then Miss Jenkins passed the cup to Mr. Ogden, and he returned it to the priest. Uh, yes. yes, and he gave it to Cara, who drank the wine. Uh, she was in ecstasy. Uh, for a moment, I thought she was going to dance. Dance? Oh, yes, it's uh, happened before, you know. Oh. Well, I, I don't think I need keep you any longer, Miss Wade. There's just one other thing I must ask you. Yes? That's if you would mind being searched. I'm afraid it's necessary. Oh, uh, then I can go. Naturally. Good. You see, Inspector, I've had something on my mind all evening. Oh? Uh, I can't remember whether or not I turned the electric heater off at home. Could be very dangerous. Well, you will soon find out, Miss Wade. Uh, yes. But... Uh, good night, Inspector. And, and thank you for being so very, very courteous. Good night, Miss Wayne. Uh, good night. Phew. Oh, As you say, Bathgate, phew. Well, that's the lot. A most unsavory case. Murder most foul. And this one is most foul. Excuse me, sir. Yes, what is it, Fox? I think Bailey has found what you were looking for. None of the personal searches reveal anything. Where was it? Up in the chancel. It had been ground into the carpet by someone's heel. Let's see. In this little box. Ah, yes. Yes, that's it, sure enough. Well done, Bro Fox. What is it? Cigarette paper, doubled over and gummed into a tiny tube. But it's red. Is it drenched in someone's life blood? It's dyed with red ink. I should think it smells, it's wet, it's a clue, it's definitely a clue. If it's wet, do you mean it's only just been dipped in red ink? Oh, 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 wait, wait a bit. Watch our little bud unfolding. It's wet with wine. Four marks for fully flowering. You mean the murderer dropped the paper into the cup? Just that. Purposely? Well, if he wanted to murder someone, it is unlikely that he would have done it accidentally. Yes. 
Not so difficult as it sounds. The murderer drops the paper in and the powder falls out. That's a bit risky, sir. I mean, the paper would float. Any of the others could see it floating. How would the murderer know it would be safe? It's risky, but not impossible. As Mr. Bathgate told us, there's only the one torch of light. Where they were kneeling, they'd be very much in the shadow. And remember, they hold the cup fairly high. They're unlikely to actually look into it. Well, Sam, you're right, Fox. How would the murderer know it would be safe? I rather think that's the crux of the whole case. The murderer is taking a risk, unless... Yes, unless? No, it's pure conjecture. When the analysts find traces of cyanide, then we can start talking. Meanwhile, I'd like to have a look at Mr. Garnet's little bottle. What? Oh, uh, you're after the invalid port, I might have guessed. Give me an ass, Basket. A little bottle of magic that Claude added to the wine to make them all more receptive. What is Garnet, Fox? Oh, he returned to his little dwelling behind the altar, as he called it. <laughs> he said he wished to meditate. Well, he'll have a nasty jolt when we suddenly appear to him. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Quiet, Bart. Glory. Hallelujah. Darn it, he was as sober as a judge a moment ago. Now he's tight as the Lord. What did he get later with? You have exceeded your duty, Chief. Exceeded your duty, never mind. Can't we say bow and get together now? Bow? Yeah, that, that's the way Ogden talks when he talks. Oh, yes, Mr. Guy. Oh, yes, get together, river. The beautiful, beautiful river. <laughs> I ran a revivalist joint down in Michigan. Oh, way, way back. They were swell, real swell. Was Mr. Ogden with you in Michigan? Am I? He thinks I'm the sand flies got as he is saturated in holy super. When did you meet Mr. Ogden? Across the Atlantic. He's all right. Saturated in simplicity. So it would appear. Listen, Chief, you got me all wrong. I never do the thing little Carrer is likely. No, sir. In this state, anything's likely. Be quiet. Yes, sir. Look, if we get together, I'll talk. What with? The stuff that speaks all languages. What's it worth for you to lay off this opposite? What's it worth to you? Or is your squeak? You're bluffing. You haven't got two pennies to rub together. Well, I got stacks of it. Stacks and stacks of it. So you say. So I say. And what I say, so I say. If you don't believe me, here are the keys. Look for yourself. Thanks. I will. And where do I look? Look at the box and desk. There's nothing to that. that. Safe. Safe's best. Safe, safe is safe. He's out for the count. What did you do? Aha. Uh -huh. No, sir. You took the gentleman. Not I. He's merely tight. Filled with the spirits. His own spirits. Well, he's only drunk one glass of brandy whilst we've been here. I saw him pour it. He was perfectly all right when we came in. This. And what's that? A little bottle of magic that Master Claw and Doc took the wine with. And what is it? Proof spirit. Overproof is like enough. Pure alcohol. Something of the sort. Have to be analyzed, of course. It seems to work, though. Garnet just turned away, and I slipped into his drink, which fortunately knocked back at one gulp. Hence the instant effect. <laughs> Why, you beastly old Borgia. Stop talking, Bathgate. Can't you see I'm detecting? What's out of the back, Fox? Just Garnet's bedroom and the usual offices. And the back door? Oh, it's a bit odd. Before you Mickey Finn, the father there, he said it was always locked. Invariable was the word he used. <laughs> well, sir, it was open. Funny. Very funny. Now, you go through the waistcoat basket in the ashtrays and grate and so on. I'll tackle the desk with these keys Garnet so kindly provided. What would you like me to do? Why don't you lug the guts into the neighbor room? Well, put this old fraud to bed. That's it. You can manage, can you? Yeah. Fox and I have work on hand. Very well. Fireman's lift for you, you horrid, heavy old man. <laughs> From his fair and unpolluted breast may violet spring. Pinks and roses, more like. The bedroom's like a whore's boudoir. We wouldn't know, would we, Fox? <laughs> you don't want me to undress the unpleasant old blob, do you? No, just cover him up and leave him out to breathe. Right. Ah, now this is interesting. Found something? Possibly. Two torn bits of paper in the grate. Badly charred. Writing in green pencil. Block capitals. Pretty hard to decipher. Say, have I missed something? Do I smell a clue? Sir, this is to warn... Blank, blank, blank... With Mrs. C. A. Mrs. Candor. It could equally well be Miss Cara. The middle bit of the Miss or Mrs. is torn. Ah, that's all there is on this fragment. The other bit's even less communicative. Put the bits away tenderly, Fox, and let's brood over it. What has the chief inspector found? Just letters. Juicy. Odious. From women? All of them. Oh. Any from the deceased, sir? Quite a few. They're all a mixture of mystical gibberish and hysterical adulation. Look at this one. Pages of the stuff. Look. Hmm. This must have been the one she sent with the bonds that Ogden mentioned. With this, you will find a parcel. It contains the bonds I spoke of, 5,000 pounds. 
Oh, hateful to speak of money, but... Well spoken, Fox. The bombs. Ogden said they should be in the safe, so let us see. Bank book. Check for Mr. Ogden, 20 pounds. <laughs> oh, he gets the money out of the gentleman, beats me. Sure, isn't it? But he does, he does. Ah, this brown paper package looks more like it. To the Reverend Father Jasper Garnet in Miss Quain's hand. Well, aren't you going to open it? Of course. Good heavens. Well? I wish Mr. Garnet were not so sound asleep. Why? I should like him to have a look at this. Right. It's all cut up bits of newspaper. Yes, it is. So you've got the motive. Possibly, possibly. Garnet has pinched the box. Ah, don't jump to conclusions. Somebody's pinched them. We'd better get fingerprints on this lot, Fox. Very good, sir. Can, can I have copy on all this? It'll be front page stuff. I'm eyewitness to a murder. All right, it's your story, but no mention of the bearer bonds. And I'd like to see the rest of it before you send it in. There's something else, sir. Yes, Fox, what is it? This. I found it in the cigarette box on the sideboard. Looks like a page from a pocket diary. Today's day and date on the top of the page. But see what's written on it. Must see you. Terrible discovery after service tonight. Written in pencils. Miss Quain's handwriting, that's certain. Fox, did you notice whether there was a small diary among the deceased's effects? Yes, sir. In her handbag. Let's have a look at it then. Yes, sir. It looks as if Miss Quain had found out about the missing bonds and wanted to have it out with the reverend gentleman tonight. How would she find out? Well... Maybe she came in earlier this afternoon when old Garnet was out, found the safe door open and had a peep inside. Maybe, but it sounds a bit careless of him to have left the safe open, don't you think? Yes, there is the diary. Today's page has been torn out. Looks as though she tore it today as well. The diary is scribbled enough to the present date. However, I don't think Mr. Garnet has read that note. No, sir? No, if he has, then I don't think he's a murderer. Why not? Because he'd have destroyed it. I don't think he knew it was there. That could follow, sir. There were only Turkish cigarettes in that particular box, and there are no corresponding buttons anywhere around. So the box probably hasn't even been opened good. Anything else, Fox? Oh, I don't think so, sir. The place has been gone over very thoroughly. Well, then we better pack up here for tonight. You've got all the bits and pieces for the lab safely stowed away. Yes, sir. Then you better put all that stuff back in the safe and lock it up. I'll hang on to the keys for the time being. Quite sure, sir. Let's see if we can tell from Mr. Garnet's book. He's got enough of them. You know, that's one of the best things I ever got from Cambridge. Learning about a chap from his book. Cambridge? Oh, that accounts for it. Accounts for what? Your style, Barky. Your style. And yours smacks entirely of the other place. I'm glad you've noticed it. How could anyone fail to? The grape and thorn together bind my brows. Delight and torment is my double me. You see? And that's a sample of Jasper Garnet's style from this slim volume of verses. Huh? Entitled Eros on Calvary and Other Poems. How inexpressibly beastly. Yes, isn't it? The Quran, spiritual experiences of a fakir, from Bolton to Hitler, the soul of the lotus bird. Oh, Kama Sutra. That's a point. I wonder if, like certain eminent Victorians, the more salacious stuff lies concealed behind the works on theology. I believe Thackeray... You're right, right Baskets. You're right. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look. Here we are. Several dusty volumes covered in the tell-tale brown paper. <laughs> oh, yes, a nasty secret hoard. Petronius, oh, yes, very nasty. Hey, let's have a look. Odd. What is? This one. Doesn't fit. Abley's Curiosities of Chemistry, published New York, 1865, by Gasop and Hoffman. Let me see. There. But do that again, Barclay. Hmm? Do what again? Close the book and let it just fall open as you did then. Very well. There. You see? The same page, damn it. But I didn't... Well, look at the heading. A simple but little-known method of making sodium cyanide. You see that, Fox? I heard, sir. Seems a bit of a coincidence, doesn't it, sir? I wonder if coincidence is quite the right word. Hey, you must listen to this. It says here that you can make sodium cyanide from woolen washing soda by heating them up in the retort or something. It goes on... It is perhaps a fortunate circumstance that this simple recipe is not generally known. The tyro is advised to avoid the experiment as it is attended by a certain amount of danger. So deadly is the poison thus produced. Quadirat demonstrandum, I'd have thought. Well, don't leap to any conclusions now, Bathgate. Well, I hope to find these books. I, I suggest it. Even the so, it doesn't give you the right to conjecture. Well, you do it all the time. Only when I forget myself. Facts, facts are what can't. Oh. And to return to facts, Fox. Sir? Can you see anything odd about these books? Well... The chemical book was a newer brown paper cover than the others have here. And the others are stained. And they smell, too. Can't quite place the smell, though it's definitely familiar. Take the cover off Curiosities. Mm -hmm. Ah, no stain on the red binding either. 
Well, there we are. You better have this gone over the fingerprints too, Fox. Yeah. But, Alley, this is the most important thing we've found so far. I mean, if the pathologist definitely finds cyanide, and it's gone, it has this book. I know, I know. It's... Extraordinarily careless of him to leave it there, don't you think? I mean, he could surely have hidden his residue book better than that. And the same thing goes for the note. But you said he never found that. Well, if that's so, why do you think it necessary to kill her? Well, Miss Queen may have rung up or something. She may, but wouldn't she have mentioned it in her note if she had? Possibly. Look, Bartgett, they all had the opportunity to commit the murder. But some had a better opportunity than others. For instance, Garnet. And they could all have had a motive. Yes, that's true. Jealousy, passion, religious mania. Oh, come on, it's bedtime. You, you're even leading me into conjecture. What do we do about him, sir? About who? The sleeping parson. We leave him. Oh, we can't. Don't worry, I'll be back tomorrow. I can't wait to see him open the surprise packet in the safe. Nor can I. I can, can't I? What? But see him open it. If you're on your own, very good and very quiet. <laughs> what time? Well, I don't particularly want to confront him when he's suffering from the remorseful hangover I'm bound to have given him. No, we'll start the day by going to Miss Quain's house. We? Naturally, I include you. Meet me at the Chateau Cain, de Mamata, a bonheur. It's all very French, isn't it? All this guilt and Louis Cairns. I must say the pictures look a bit out of place. Impressionists, also French, remember? Genuine? I presume so. Must be worth a small fortune to somebody. Done any good soothing since I saw you last night? A few reports from the specialists, most of them blank. Just routine stuff. I'm told it's the routine stuff that pays off in the end. Then they told you true, Bathgate. They told you true. What about here? Well, it's the large establishment, as you see. The servants haven't come up with anything of interest. There's just the housekeeper and the chauffeur left. You mean you've actually been interviewing before I got here? Well, I said I'd start up on her. That means early. But what about clues? Mm, surely there must be something. Nothing spectacular. A lot of letters from Darabin. Letters of the heart. May I? No, you may not. You've seen quite enough already. Besides, there's only one that has any bearing on the case. Oh, yes. He warns her off her role as chosen vessel and implies that she is risking her life if she goes through with it. Does that imply that he'd take her life if she did carry on with the game? He doesn't say that. He asked her to destroy the letter and all the others he wrote, but she was a woman and, of course, didn't. Mm, suspicious. Then there's the blotter on her desk. There's always the blotting pad. Don't be facetious. What you detectives will do when we all use ballpoints, I can't imagine. Did you hold it up to a mirror and read a full confession? Or was it in code? It was in French. A letter, several pages, smudged and unreadable. And an address. But of course you could read that. Actually, no. We could make out one or two words there, and by comparing these with Miss Quain's address book, we deduced that she'd written to a certain Comtesse de Bassac. Mm, deduction? Oh, just elementary stuff, my dear Barclay. And? That's it. Fox and his many men are now going through the place with a fine tooth comb. Oh, where is that woman? Hmm? Who? The housekeeper. I kept her till last because they said she'd be in a state of shock as a result of her mistress's death. The old family retainer type, by all accounts. Yeah. Ah, this must be she. Now, look, Bartley, you sit down in that wing chair over there. With a bit of luck, she won't see you. What? We don't want to alarm the lady unnecessarily. Oh, well, really. Come in. Sir? Oh, I'm sorry about all this, but I'm afraid it's necessary. I quite understand. How are you feeling? Recovered, thank you. I put my trust in the Lord. Very wise. Oh, do sit down. Now, you are Miss Edith Heborn, I'm right? Yes, sir. And how long have you been with Miss Quinn? Nearly all her life. She was just three months old when I first took her. I became her nanny. And when she grew up? I became her housekeeper. Tell me about her childhood, her family. Her father, Colonel Quain, died in India before she was born. The mistress had turned to England and died within a year. A tragic beginning. And a tragic end, sir. Yes. What happened to you and the baby? We went to France and stayed with the mistress's aunt. She died when Miss Cara was 17. And then? We went to live in Paris. Miss Cara liked it. She had friends there. And was Monsieur de Ravine one of these friends? He was. Did you think he is a suitable friendship? I did, until recently. Why did you change your opinion? It was after we came to London. Monsieur de Ravine came over soon afterwards. He said that London appealed to him, though we knew it was Miss Cara that did the appealing. And then he changed. How? It was that newfangled religion that did it. Religion. A lot of wicked claptrap. The house of the sacred flame. Sacred? Heathen humbug. It changed Miss Cara, too. Changed her whole nature. I'll never forgive him for introducing her to that place. Although I'm strictly chapel myself, I brought her up as a good Anglican. It's what her parents would have wished. Quite right of you, Nanny. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, don't worry, sir. I, I've always been nanny, ever since she could talk. I'm sure you have. You see, there, were, there was nothing I could do. I just had to stand by and watch her turn her back on the Lord and go down the way of damnation. And when she said she was to become a chosen leader, I wished... I wished... 
I almost wish she'd died when she was an innocent child. That's rather a hard thing to say, Nanny. Well, I feel hard when I think of my poor lamb cut off in the midst of her silly wickedness with heathen words on her lips. And that goings on there. She thought I didn't know, but I knew. I knew. How did you know? I heard things when they came here. Oh, that Mrs. Candor, she was the worst. But she doesn't come here anymore. Oh, why? She and the mistress had words about a month ago. Accusations about Mr. Garnet. Jealous she was. Uh, Mr. Garnet himself? Him! Ha! He's a limb of Satan speaking from the heart of hell's hottest fire. Yes. What did Miss Quain do yesterday, before the ceremony? Well, the morning she spent in what was called meditation. Then she asked for the car at two o'clock, and Wilson took her to the church. She was back by three. She seemed very upset when she got home and went straight to her room. One other question. What did you do last evening when Miss Quain was out? I went for a walk. In all that rain? I'd wanted to go to chapel later, but I was that worried I followed her up to the hall. I think I meant to stand up for the Lord in the midst of his enemies. And when you got there? The door was shut. But I couldn't rest till I knew if... Well, if she was actually going through with it. I walked round the block to the back of the building. There was a door. It was slightly open. So? So So I... you walked in? Yes. I felt I had to. What did you see there? Them. Kneeling and chanting. Possessed they were. There were torches and pagan music. Worse than the followers of Baal, they were lost in darkness. I wanted to cry out. I wanted to, but I couldn't find my voice. Something broke in me. I had to go. But did you actually see Miss Quain take the cup? No. I was spared that. But she wasn't, was she? She wasn't spared. But she could have been, couldn't she? Where did you write to Mr. Garnet to warn him off, Miss Carlin? You know that. Yes. Last Friday. We should have got it on Saturday. And you went to the hall partly to see if he'd taken heed of your warning? Yes. Well, I think that'll be all. Thank you, Nanny. Thank you, sir. I feel... I feel as it was all my fault. Poor lost soul. God sits in judgment, Nanny. And I'm sure that he will judge wisely and happily. I hope so. So we can account for the torn note in the grate. What about that for an attack of religious fervor? It's healthier than the other kind. She sounded like someone I once heard at Speaker's Corner. Fire, brimstone and certain death. Death maybe, but not murder. Mm -hmm. What makes you so sure? Remember the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. She'd never break that. It's a pity Father Garnet and his flock don't hold to that as well. It's a pity everybody doesn't. Enough of moralizing. There's work to be done. I must have a word with the chauffeur and then on to her solicitor, old Rattisman. Right. Wrong. What? Rattisman is very correct and would not appreciate your company. Oh. But he's a nice old Dickensian fusspot. Even though at times he does give me the idea he's a good actor slightly overdoing his part. I can guess what has brought you, Chief Inspector. I suppose there's no doubt about it being a case of homicide. No, I'm afraid, Mr. Rattisman, it's a bizarre case. Bizarre? It's most regrettable. Have Miss Quain's affairs always been in your hands, sir? Oh, yes, yes. Colonel Quain, her father, old family clients, charming fellow. And had you seen Miss Quain recently? Uh, five weeks ago tomorrow. In fact, she came in order to change the terms of her will. I imagined as much. Can you tell me anything about that? Anything relevant, that is? It's extremely distasteful to discuss the client's affairs. But in this case, necessary. <laughs> well, I can care. So I shall lay the whole matter before you. She informed me she wished to draw up a new will, but the terms she proposed astounded me. Astounded me. The previous will had been a very proper and sensible disposition of her considerable fortune. Several large sums to various charities, annuities to her servants, various legacies... The residuary legatee was a third cousin in France, a relation of her mother's, a boy whom she had never seen. It was all perfectly proper. And the new will? Oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear. This is really very painful. Well, she wished to increase the annuity to her former nanny. Her house and its contents she wished to leave to Monsieur de Ravine. But then, then, there was a considerable legacy to Father Jasper Garnet and the rest of her very considerable fortune, every penny of it. She would leave to the House of the Sacred Flame, making Father Garnet the sole trustee. Yes, Mr. Rattisman, I appreciate your concern. I was horrified. Horrified. So I made inquiries about Father Garnet, and what I discovered did not reassure me. In fact, I overstepped the limits of legal propriety by repeatedly urging her to reconsider. But 
she refused. She simply would not listen to reason. She was most excitable, intolerant of any suggestion. If I wouldn't draw up her will for her, she said, she would get a form from a stationer's and fill it in herself. I see. So I complied, but with a very heavy heart instead. Now, there was obviously no more that you could do, Sam. The religious organization will become more than wealthy, and Mr. Garnet will be a fairly rich man. Damn it. Forgive my intrusion, but is it your personal opinion that events will enable him to enjoy his game? He'll need every penny before I've done with him. A very cryptic answer. Yours was a very leading question. <laughs> I agree, and not entirely proper. <laughs> what was my reply? Tell me, is there no chance of contesting the will? I mean, suppose, for instance, Garnet had been giving her drugs. If you find any evidence to that effect, I would be most grateful if you would call on me again. Certainly. Well, I won't take up any more of your valuable time, and I myself have an appointment with Mr. Garnet and his initiates. The, uh, suspects in the case? I suppose you could call them that. Well, for the sake of my client, may I wish you luck. I hope you catch Father Garnet by the heels. At the moment, I'm rather more interested in catching the look on his face when he opens a certain package. Robbed! I've been robbed! Oh, oh, oh yeah? The bonds they got. Is that so? You must think we're pretty simple, Father Garnet. I'm afraid I don't quite follow. Has the money disappeared? Do you mean no, Miss Wade? It's just disguised yourself as the evening newspaper. That who oh, has yeah. done this? I swear I never touched the thing. Nor did I. Which of you has done this thing? I suggest, Father, that you yourself are best situated to answer that question. You have always kept the keys since poor Cara made her gift. How dare you suggest such a oh, thing, Monsieur yeah. Ravine? How dare I you? My uh, look at him, oh. Janey. Look. Oh. All of you. To the pure, all things are pure. Maurice. Just a minute. Forgive us, Inspector. We forget ourselves. Since no one is prepared to volunteer any positive information about the missing bonds, I have another exhibit I wish to bring to your notice. Uh, the book, if you please, Fox. Here we are, sir. Now, does anybody know anything about this? What is it, Miss Jenkins? I, I can't see. It's Abelie's Curiosities of Chemistry. Hey, why? Yes, why? Mr. Ogden? Why, nothing, Chief, except I'm curious to know where you located that book. Does anybody else know anything about this book? Yes, I do. Well, Mr. Garnet? This volume appeared in my shelves some weeks ago. It is not mine, and I do not know whence it came. When did you first discover it? I do not remember. It was there three weeks ago, wasn't it, Lionel? Yes, Claude, it was. How do you know? Because I saw well, it. Well, both saw it. But it was at the back of the shelf behind some other books. I know. I put them there myself the week before I found it. A marvelous oh, book. Oh, marvelous books. Oh, we've read them all. And did you read this one? Oh, no, it looked too boring. Ever so dull. I don't understand. Why is such a fuss being made about this book? Because it is a treatise on poisons. Kara was poisoned. Find the owner of that book and there's the murderer. Not Which necessarily, Mr. Pringle, but it would help us in our investigations. Well, any offers? Then on to the next item, Fox. Item, one cigarette box. Benares ware, containing cigarettes. Turkish. Put it on the table, Fox. This is your property, Mr. Garnet. Uh, yes. Will you open it? What's this, a conjuring trick? I'm not a magician, don't you agree, Mr. Garnet? But this note is hers, her handwriting. Read out the message, Fox. Must see you. Terrible discovery. After service. When was this put here? Yesterday afternoon, between two and three o'clock. You haven't seen the note before? No. And you didn't see Miss Quain when she called? No. Father Garnet was my guest to lunch yesterday. He left me shortly before. Three. Did any of you see Miss Quain here yesterday? Oh, yes, I did. Uh, about a quarter to three. Uh, I was here doing my meditation. Why did you say nothing of this before, Miss Wade? Because you didn't ask me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think there's any need for me to keep you any longer. The meeting is adjourned. With your permission, Inspector. I will leave my people in a short prayer. We'll pray for the power of light to enlighten your dark. Yes, there are one or two dark corners. I must confess, any help will be welcome. Then come, dear people. Yes, yes Father. 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 Oh, must we, Janie? Yes, Maurice, if only to show solidarity. Uh, Miss Wade, would you mind yes. staying behind for a moment? There are just one or two things I wish to clear up. Uh, uh, certainly. Uh, Inspector. Later, Mr. Ogden, later. Oh, well. Good all. It really was very naughty of you to conceal information, Miss Wayne. Well, I wasn't doing that, was I? Now, tell us what you can. Uh, well, you know, Inspector, I've been thinking, if the bonds were stolen, perhaps they were stolen yesterday afternoon, and perhaps that's what Clara meant when she said she would tell Father Garnet about it. You heard her say that? Yesterday afternoon, uh, when I was meditating. I overheard her. She was in the father's room, and the door must have been open. Who was she talking to? Oh, I couldn't hear. Uh, the other person was mumbling. Uh, but Cara, Cara was shouting. She was very distracted when she came out. 
I didn't notice her go in, you see. I must have arrived after her. And she left at 2.45, you uh, That's say. right. Can you repeat exactly what you overheard Miss Quain say? Uh, she said, um, I don't believe you're speaking the truth. And I shall tell Father Garnet what you've done. Couldn't have been the father to whom she was speaking, or she wouldn't have said that, would she? Miss Wade, have you mentioned this to anyone else? Uh, no, I don't think so. Then I implore you not to. Do you understand? Really, I, I can't say that I do. Miss Wade, to please a poor policeman, please promise. Very well, I promise. <laughs> I must say, it's a pity a, a gentleman like you has come down to this sort of work. You have what my dear mamma would have yes? called... Oh, sorry. It's all right, Mr. Ogden. Miss Wade was just going. You will have to tell me some other time what your dear mamma said. But, Fox, will you see Miss Wade gets a taxi? But I don't want one. Yes, you do, Miss Wade. I'll see you out. I've forgotten all about you, Bathgate. We also serve, you know. Besides, you tell me to promise to keep quiet. And see you keep that promise. Anything to oblige a poor policeman. Why all the sudden politeness? I want to have a word with Miss Jenkins. Well, I promise not to tell Angela just to oblige a poor newspaper man. Thank you, Miss Wade. <laughs> Good afternoon, Inspector. And I, I, I'm sorry to have got it all uh, so confused. Come on, Not at I... all. You were very helpful. <laughs> was she? What? Helpful. No, no. She was hopelessly muddled. Still, we had to humor her. Well, you don't have to humor me. Do you know why I want a word with you? I imagine you want to own up. Then what do you mean? A uh, confession? No, just to the book on chemistry. We've, we'd have found out sooner or later. Hmm. Uh, how'd you guess it was mine? Well, we know you're something of an engineer by profession, and then the book is an American publication. Well, you're right. But you know, I didn't miss it from my shelves until last night. I looked for it to check up on something after Kyra had been poisoned, and the book was gone. When did you say it last? At a party I gave four weeks ago. I showed it to Ravine, since he collects old books, but he didn't seem that interested. And that was the last time? Well, it might have been there when young Claude came to collect some books Garnet had lent me. Books in brown paper covers? Why, oh, yes. <laughs> Classics. And boy, what classics. And your book, did it have a paper cover? Well, it didn't need one, did it? Not a book on chemistry. <laughs> no, it stood there in its honest red binding. And you saw it when Claude came? Well, I think so, but I just can't remember for sure. Mr. Ogden, why do you suggest just now that Mr. Garnet had taken those bombs? I'm not saying anything. Well, that's up to you. Just how many of you are there in all this with Garnet? I'm not in on any homicide racket with anyone. I'll get that straight. Now, there are more rackets than murder, you know. What are you aiming at? Merritt, you're essentially a businessman, a one who would like to see a more tangible return of your money than a dose of spiritual uplift. <laughs> Maybe. In short, I want to know how you stand as regards the finances of this affair. What makes you think I look upon this as a business venture? I think you're a shrewd man, Mr. Ogden. <laughs> All right. Well, God and I are both in this on a percentage basis. Were there any other shareholders? Only to Ravine. He chipped in to the tune of uh, 500 pounds. How did it work? Like any other company. I'm the biggest shareholder. Garnet is paid a salary and draws 20% of the profits. By the way, did you know Mr. Garnet is a fellow countryman of yours? <laughs> Never. In a sense, he told me so himself. And he piled up one more to his total. And I suppose you don't know about the drugs either. What's that? You trying to say that he's peddling dope? To the best of my belief, yes. Now, look, Chief, as God's my witness, I, I would never have touched this concern if... Oh, heck, what's the use? The innocent are perfectly safe as long as they stick to the truth, Mr. Ogden. I'm sure it'll come out what the Australians call Jake Lou. I wouldn't know what the Australians say. I've never been down under. Have any of the others? Garnet, for instance? Oh, I wouldn't know. But let's hope you find your man. Oh, you can trust us, Mr. Ogden. The British police are probably the most trustable in the world. So I've heard, so I've heard. Well, thank you. Inspector Fox and I must leave you now. I'm afraid we have to get back to the yard. Even we have our office work. I'm afraid the in tray's got a bit overloaded in the last 24 hours, sir. Well, unload it then, Brer Fox. A long report from the fingerprint people, but it all adds up to a blank. Then there's this letter from uh, Mr. Rattisbon, the solicitor, sent round by special messenger. Had as much ceiling wax on it as Magna Carta. Let's see. Uh, uh, would you believe it? Yes, sir, in this case, anything. Rat is but right, but after we called, he opened his post and in it discovered a letter from Miss Quain enclosing a new will. She must have written it after her return from the hall. She even put the time on top of the form at 3.30 p.m. What were the changes, sir? The legacy to her staff at the Ravine are the same, but she's changed the legacy to the sect, the lion's share. In fact, everything, everything goes to Father Garnet himself. But Why? In her letter to Radisbon, she said she had made a terrible discovery 
that Garnet was the victim of an unholy plot and that she would come round and explain. Which she never did. So it looks as if the interview Cara Quain had that afternoon at a quarter to three led directly to the alteration of her will. And that whoever was discovered there doing something terrible... Taking the bonds, perhaps? Decided there and then that he had to kill her? Not necessarily. Besides, it would take more than a few hours to prepare the poison. That's if they follow the book. But the motive? Oh, I think it was to keep Miss Quain quiet, all right. But I think her death was premeditated. What other excitements in store? The report from the labs on the blotting paper on Miss Quain's desk. And? They can't make it out. We wired the contest to buy to see if she's kept that letter. Thank to God she has. And we wire New York to check on Ogden and Garnet. And we'd also wire Australia. Oh, uh, why would that be, sir? Oh, just a hunch. Yeah. There's the analyst's report on the cigarettes found in Garnet's room. Oh? The Turkish ones on the top were innocent enough. But those underneath... We're all done. So we've got him on that count at least. So we take Mr. Garnet? Oh, no, Fox. We'll let the bird flap his wings for a while. Who knows where he may yet lead us. Apart from a lot of divisional bump, the only other thing is the pathologist's report. Poisoning by sodium cyanide. As we thought. Look, Fox, have you got Mr. Abley with you? Sir? The chemical recipe book. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Here we are, sir. Now, how did Mrs. Beaton do it? Equal weight of wool and dry washing soda and iron. Filings cook red hot for three to four hours. Cool... Add water and boil for several more hours, and it goes on. Real three witches stuff. You really must want to kill someone very badly to go through all that. But it could be done without laboratory equipment. A good point, Fox. A house-to-house campaign is indicated. Mr. Bathgate shall help us do it. We'll make him work for the privileges we're allowing him. Hello? If you're not alone, say hello, darling. Hello, darling. That's right. Now, answer simply and lovingly. Is Miss Jenkins with you? Yes, and Pringle. Look, pretend I'm Angela and answer who is Pringle. Uh, Oh, he's just a friend, darling. And Miss Jenkins. I know. Uh, Now, there's no need to be jealous, Angela, my love. They're engaged, just like us. Now, listen, have you all got friendly? Of course we have. Good. Now, can you get yourself invited to either or both of their flats? But, darling, I did all that ages ago. You mean you already have been to their flats? (laughs) Don't be silly, Angela, my sweet. I'm not a fast worker. We're all going to a show, then on to dinner. But first, I've got to take Mr. Pringle and Miss Jenkins back to their places to change. Well, see, they both ask you in. Oh, that goes without saying, my sweet. Why don't you join us? Where are you? At the yard. Yarborough? Long distance, a very expensive call. Is there anything I can do for you in London? Now, listen carefully. When you get to their flats, I want you to keep your eyes open. Naturally, darling. But must it be pink, my sweet? Now, don't be too clever, Bathgate. Pay attention. When you're there, I want you to observe certain things. Now, this is what I want you to look out for. It's a nice place, Miss Jenkins. A bit cramped, I'm afraid. Uh, did Morris help you to a drink? Of course yes, I did. Thanks. Will you have one? No, thanks, Morris. I'm all ready. And very attractive you look, too. If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Pringle. You can say what you like. I'm going to have another drink. Do, do you think I could have another one, too? Oh, of course. Sir. I'd like ice in it this time, if there is any. Yes, in the kitchen. I'll get you some. No, don't, Mother. I'll get it. You know, other people's kitchens fascinate me. I, I'm just nosy. But it's no No, trouble. I insist. It's through here, isn't it? Yes. Oh, you shouldn't have any more, darling. The cigarettes are bad enough. Don't drink too much as oh, well. Oh, for God's sake, don't start nagging. It's just that I'm afraid you'll say something... About Sunday afternoon? Yes, partly. We must stick to what we've said. That's my pigeon, but can I trust you? Of course you can. You know that. But you must give up those filthy oh, shut cigarettes. Shut up, Janie. I will, I will, but... Not yet! Here, As you. the man on the Titanic said, I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> Your refrigerator seems somewhat overproductive. Yes, I'm afraid it is. You don't seem quite so well provided for in the cookery department. No, uh, I eat out most of the time. Eh? I just boil the odd egg or two on a gas ring out there. That's very sensible. I'd always eat out if I could. What about you, Mr. Pringle? Oh, Morris leads a lazy life. He has one of those overheated service flats. All the food sent up from the restaurant. He doesn't <laughs> even have a kitchen. It's very wise. I say, is that the time? If we're going to make the theatre before curtain up, we really should knock our drinks back and get over to Mr. Pringle's place so that he can get changed. I don't want to change. Morris! <laughs> Where I'm taking you for dinner, they're pretty formal. I mean, you needn't put on a black tie if you don't want to, but you must wear some sort of tie, I'm afraid. Uh, that is something upon which they insist. I'm glad you insisted on Morris's coming back here to change. He's got so, so slipshod lately. You know why he is as he is, I suppose. Yes, I think so. It's not only cigarettes now. It's got worse than that. He's taking the stuff in the bedroom now. I know he is. 
When he comes back, he'll see. He's like a stranger. How did it start? Father Garnet is responsible. Yeah. But Morris is innocent of all this. And Cara's death. I know he's innocent. Well, how can you be so sure? He... He knows something which he won't tell. Mm -hmm. He made me promise not to tell anyone either. Oh, then break your promise. I can't. Not even to help Morris? He needs help. I know. Also, he himself could be in danger. But surely the police don't suspect him. I wasn't thinking of the police. Do you remember the Unicorn Theatre case? Oh, vaguely. There was a man in that who knew something he wouldn't tell. He was killed. Yes, I see. So for his own safety, I think Morris should tell. But he won't tell. He'll never tell. Then you must. All right. Uh, but quickly, in case he comes back. That afternoon, the, the day of the murder, Morris went back to the house of the sacred flame. But you said he was with you all day. He told me to say that. He wasn't. I mean, he was until after lunch. Mm -hmm. Then then we had a row, a dreadful row, about the drugs and so on. I told him about Cara, that she was taking them, that she and Father Garnet, what they were, what they did... Mm -hmm. He was angry, furious. He said he'd go right away and get some more of the stuff, a big shot of it. And he went. I couldn't stop him. What time was all this? Oh, he left my flat about half past two. And when did he come back? Early evening. He came to pick me up to go to the service. He behaved as though nothing had happened. Oh, you should have told all this to Inspector Alain a lot earlier. It would have saved the police a great deal of trouble. And made trouble for Morris. Oh, you don't know what he can be like. He frightens me sometimes. I'm frightened now. Now that you tell me? Yes. Oh, he didn't ever know. Inspector Alain is very human and very discreet. Then you'll tell him. Of course. It's what you wanted, isn't it? Well, isn't it? Well, <coughs> you two, what have you both been burbling about while I was getting dressed? <laughs> about you, good-looking. Well, we must put a stop to all that, mustn't we? I'll stop it with a kiss. <laughs> now, don't be silly, darling. Mm. Oh, sorry, Janey, I... Lost my head. I sometimes do lose my head, you know. Come on now, Morris. We mustn't be late for Mr. Bartgate's party. Party! Yes, I feel like a party. An all-night party. Uh, just theatre and dinner, I'm afraid. I don't think we should make it too late. After all, it's the inquest tomorrow morning. The inquest? Yes, I'd quite forgotten. What'll happen, Mr. Bartgate? Oh, I expect there'll be a quick show and then an adjournment. An adjournment? For what? <laughs> for Chief Detective Inspector Alain to earn his wages, of course. A very satisfactory result, Foxkin. I wish all coroners could be as quick and understanding as that one. We're certainly having to work for our money this time, sir. You've been doing all the hard slogs since the inquest, Fox. I've merely been sitting back here at my desk musing and trying to fit the facts together. What new facts are there? Well, Sergeant Bailey and I visited Miss Wade's apartment. More of a room, really. Sort of private hotel. All meals taken in the restaurant. Then we went to Lionel and Claude's flat. <laughs> Studio, I think you would call it. There's a sort of gallery where they sleep. No bathroom or kitchen of their own, either. They share these with two other gentlemen who have a flat on the ground floor. Sergeant Bailey had some pretty strong comments about it all, I can tell you. We are more tolerant, aren't we, Fox? Oh, yes, sir. And Mrs. Cander? Well, she lived in a sort of hothouse. Plants and radiators everywhere. Terrible gurgling they make. <laughs> a woman reader said she's half dopey most of the time. Mm. She said that Mrs. Candor's cat had a better sense of decency than its mistress. A very jealous lady, Fox. Beware of jealousy. It's often a very strong motive, sir. There's gain. Yes, sir. And that brings me to Monsieur de Ravigny. A leading statement, Fox. What leads you to that? Well, I got the impression, sir, from visiting the Monsieur's flat, that his circumstances were... Well, how can one best put it? Somewhat straightened. Well, I didn't feel there was any shortage of money there, Fox. It depends what you're used to, doesn't it, sir? The Monsieur lives in quite a grand style... I just thought that he was perhaps finding it difficult to carry on living in that style to which he felt he was accustomed. What gave you that impression? Oh, Fox, dear Valpine Fox, you mean out on your own detecting again? Well, one can't help noticing things, sir. The staff supported my conclusions. Staff? Oh, yes, sir. It's a large flat, a mansion flat, central ages throughout. Ravine's got a butler and his wife who live in the kitchen wing. The master never goes out there, apparently. Very old-fashioned in his ways. There's a maid who lives in and a daily woman who cleans. Yes, I see what you mean about style. If he's hard up, then Cara's legacy will be extremely useful. Her pictures alone will fetch a pretty penny in the sale room. I don't think he'll sell them, sir. No? No, sir. He said he will keep them as a memento of his...
poor Carter. You saw him, then? Yes, sir. He, uh, well, received me in his study. Say, so he knew the terms of Miss Crane's will, that he was a principal beneficiary. Yes, but he was, I think, talking about the earlier will, not the one she wrote up that afternoon. Well, they're both the same from his point of view. What else did you learn? That Miss Crane's friend, the Countess de Barsac, is his sister. Uh, oh. And that she's in a private hospital in the south of France and can't be disturbed. Yes, I know that, but my friends at the Charité are probably disturbing her at this very moment. I'm waiting for their telegram. He also remembered seeing the chemistry book that night at Ogden's party. Garnet saw it there too, he says. He spilt some whiskey near it and picked the book up. Ogden then came over and asked its value. Whiskey, whiskey? The smell, sir. The familiar smell. Well, it might be familiar to you, Brer Fox. What are you talking Those about? Those other books. The priest's dirty books. That's what they smelled of. Whiskey. Oh, you always had a good nose, Fox. Thank you, And sir. I think you're on the right scent. I think so too, sir. Well, enough of self-congratulation. <laughs> Whom else have we to visit? Well, Mr. Barkate has dealt very creditably with Miss Jenkins and Mr. Pringle. Yes, I must get the tooth out of that young man, if any for his own good. But just leave the American gentleman. There was no reply from his flat when I went round earlier. Then we'll both call in on Mr. Ogden on my way to see young Pringle. I want to survey the scene of that party where the beastly chemistry book made its first public appearance. You gentlemen would like to wait in the sitting room until Mr. Ogden gets back. It shouldn't be long. Uh, thank you, Miss... Um... Elsie. Everyone calls me Elsie. I'm sure they do. Uh, Fox. Uh, yes, uh, um, Elsie, could you tell me where the, um, bathroom is? If it's the lavatory you want, it's down the corridor, just past the kitchen. Thank you. Uh, don't worry, I'll find it. Uh, you look after Mr. Ogden, do you? Yes, I does for him and cooks when he's in. He's a very easy gentleman. But this is an old-fashioned flat and there's lots of hard work. Humping the coals up and down is the worst of it, and the dust it makes. I know an open fire is nice and friendly, but it makes a lot of work. I've got a nice electric eater myself down in the basement where I live with my mother. My dad, when he was alive, owned the whole house and we lived in it all. But then the neighbourhood went up in the world, so Mum and I went down. Yes. Elsie, I wonder if you can help us. You see, my friend and I are policemen. Is it the murder? The murder at that church where Mr. Ogden goes? Uh, something quite as dramatic as that, I'm afraid. Oh. Uh, we're looking for a valuable book that Mr. Ogden has lost. Do you remember it? It's a big red book. Yes, it used to be on that shelf, but I haven't seen it for some time. Since when? Oh, I couldn't say, sir. Do you remember that night about three or four weeks ago when there was a big party here? Yes, my mother and I helped. Was it here then? I think so. But no, the next day it had gone. Oh, yes, I remember now. I did the tidying up and I dusted extra special because Mum and I were off on our holiday the next day and Mr. Ogden was to do for himself. There was a gap on the shelf, so I thought the book had been left to someone. And do you remember five books in brown paper covers? Oh, yes. Not very nice books from what I could make out. They were piled on the side there. On the night of the party, someone spilled some drink near them. A French gentleman, I think. The mark's still there. And what happened to them? Sometime later, after we got back from our gate, that soft youth from the church came for them. Six of them there were. Six books? Yes, I know, because they just fitted into his briefcase. I see. It didn't look as though he had the strength to carry them all, poor thing. Oh, you found it all right, did you, Sergeant? Detective Inspector, Elsie. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all modern cons, thank you, miss. It is modern, you know. At least the kitchen is. I know, I went in there first. Oh. Uh, by mistake. Very up-to-date saucepans and all that. Fire so the pots are. Sort of glass. I'm afraid of breaking one of them, though heaven knows it's hard enough. Do you know Mr. Ogden managed to smash one whilst I was on holiday? He got a new one and hoped I wouldn't notice it. Well, I never mentioned it. You know what men are. I expected he would be embarrassed. He's been so clumsy. He even ruined the poker. Looked as though someone had chewed it. You would have thought it possible. No, men need looking after. That's what my mum always says. Oh, would she be living with me not offering you a cup of tea? Would you uh, No, thank you, Elsie. We won't wait any longer for Mr. Ogden. Inspector Fox has to go and talk to Claude Wheatley, yes. the, the boy who collected those books back from here. Haven't you, Fox? Sure. Oh, oh, yes. And I have to go and have a few words with an even more unfortunate young man. You've been very helpful, Elsie. I am sorry about the tea. I really am. You won't mention it to my mother if you see her, will you? Who told you all this? I want to know who told you. We found out, Mr. Pringle. After all, we are supposed to be detectives. Detectives? You know quite well that we can arrest you on the grounds of receiving prohibited drugs. If it comes to that, what will you then do about your supplies of heroin? It's a lie. The facts are here, Pringle, in your flat. You need treatment, and we can help you. But first, you must help us. What do you want to know? You went to Father Garner's room that Sunday afternoon, and said to Carter Quayne. 
At the precise time when you were there, she was overheard having a row with somebody. Now, she said, I shall tell Father Garnet what you have done. To whom did she say that? It wasn't to me. Then you did overhear it? Yes. Was it to Mr. Ravine? I won't tell you. To Mr. Ogden? I won't tell you. You had gone there to get more heroin. No comment. Is it Mr. Garnet who supplies you with the drug? Garnet didn't kill Miss Quain, I can tell you that much, and neither did I. But you may be an accessory before the fact, and if you've taken Miss Jenkins into your confidence, you made her an accessory after the fact. You are both liable to arrest. Look, Jane has got nothing to do with it. That'll be for a court of law to decide, won't it? Unless you tell me the truth. Well? Oh, I don't help you. You went to Garnet's collect some more of your filthy drug. It was kept in the bedroom. Whilst you were there, someone came into the sitting room from the hall. They opened the safe. You saw them, but were afraid to come out. And then Cara Quain came in and caught whoever it was red-handed with the bond. They had a row. She left, and you tiptoed out through the back door, leaving it unlocked. Now, why didn't you tackle the intruder? It was either because it was someone to whom you were deeply attached, or someone who had a very strong hold over you. Of course, it's possible you no longer have either a sense of responsibility or any human feelings left whatsoever. I have. I tell you, I have. I do have feelings. Then prove it. Who are you trying to protect? Look, give me... Give me time. Time. I, I, I must think things out. I'll give you until tomorrow. And Pringle? What, what? You won't try anything silly, will you? It won't do anyone any good. You do understand, don't you? Well, is everything all right? Are all the suspects there in El Garnet's room? Yes, we'll just give them a moment to settle down. Uh, Fox, sir, is the eavesdropper fixed? Yes, sir. Eavesdropper? What do you mean? We've installed a microphone in Garnet's room with a small loudspeaker over there. So you've bugged the Reverend Father. Going a bit far, isn't it? I always like a dramatic close to my cases. It casts a spurious but acceptable glamour over the more squalid aspects of my profession. I must remember that. You wrote it about my solution of the O'Callaghan case, remember? I think we should be quiet, sir. Be quiet, Bathgate. The voice of America, loud, clear, and too good to be true. Quiet, Bathgate. Right. Now, we thought this should be a regular meeting in order to sort out one or two things in the light of recent events. I cannot really say the necessity... No, you wouldn't. The house of the sacred flame, as well as being a church, is also a business concern. And I would like to see it wound up in a businesslike manner. Business concern. Wound up? That's right. I'm the largest shareholder, and I want to pull out. To this end, my lawyer's drawn up this document, of which we each have a copy on the table. But this is monstrous. You can't do this. No, Mr. Trumpel, you can't. Oh, well, I can, and it's all quite legal. <laughs> the profits of this outfit belong to me, Ravine, and Garnet, in that order. And the bonds, they're also the property of the principal shareholders? That will be so, but the bonds are not here. They're being lifted, haven't they, Mr. Garnet? And do you think whoever took those bonds also murdered my poor car? Indeed, I do. And those Richie cops think so, too. But I it's do. you. Shh. Don't you? Oh, don't you, Father Garnet? Who had my book on poisons hidden in his shell? Oh. Who had control of the safe keys? Who kitted Carr into leaving my fortune? Good he left his honor to the temple, not to me. How the blazes do you know that? You know it, too. I told you. But she did leave you personally a large sum of money as well. Yes, she did. And Monsieur de Ravine as well. Yes. She left him her house, her pictures. I do not her. wish to discuss that. He wouldn't. Shh. But Mr. Ogden, you seem to make out this strong argument against this priest. Father Garn is a murderer. Oh, this is nonsense. Oh, oh, this is a Listen, you girl. Shut up. up. No, I won't. Right, that's how you get crashed. Come on, all of you. All of you, let's go. I know what happened that Sunday afternoon. Oh, what are you talking about, Pringle? You're a dope. No. But about the first time in six months, I'm not under the influence of drugs. And let's make no bones about it. Half of us are soaked in the stuff. Dagmar, Cara, me, pretty Tweedledum and little Tweedledee. Oh, really? It's a lie. It's true. Father Garnet dishes out the stuff and we take it. He gets it via Paris from an agent here in London. He doesn't know who the agent is, but I do. Is all this really necessary? Yes, it is. You see, I came here that Sunday afternoon. I was in the bedroom when I heard the safe door open. I looked through and saw who it was. It was... Shut up! No! Shut up, shut up! If you don't shut up yourself, I'll make you... Yeah, you and who else? Me! Why, you... You can't escape, Mr. Ogden. The building is surrounded. You're under arrest. You can't do this. I'm an American citizen. Are you? What do you mean? It's not what the Australian police tell me. Who is S.J. Samuels? Convicted two years... For the sale of prohibited drugs. Never heard of him. I was born in Michigan. Then Australia may congratulate herself. Have him taken away, Fox. Yes, sir. I demand to see my attorney. You haven't heard the last from me. Of course we haven't. I look forward to hearing a lot more when you're in the witness box. The charge is, of course, murder. So much for your accusations against the innocent, Mr. Ogden. I wouldn't be too pleased with yourself if I were you, Garnet. You're under arrest, too. No. no, 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 no. Quiet, my children, quiet. 
Why? The sale and distribution of prohibited drugs is also a serious charge, and that is precisely what we're charging yes. you with, even though you may be an American citizen. This is a conspirator. This man, whom I have taken to my bosom, is a viper. Oh, oh can now it? Now, take them away, both of them. They make me sick. Come on, gentlemen. There's a nice yeah. black man waiting outside for the piano. I'm sorry about the interruption, Mr. Pringle, but Mr. Ogden was carrying a gun, and we thought you ought to be allowed to finish your story. Oh, Morris. Let Mr. Pringle continue, Miss Jenkins. <clears throat> well, uh, Cara came in and asked Ogden what he was doing with the bonds from the safe. He didn't answer, but spoke quite calmly about the drugs. He said he owned the whole racket, and that if she did anything or said anything, he would stop the supplies. She was hooked, and he knew it. So was I. I was in the same boat, you see. If I told anyone, I wouldn't be able to get any supplies either. He had us both. He could have killed you, too. You've been very brave and very helpful, and we'll see you get treatment. Now, all of you, I think you should return to your homes. We'll be in touch, I'm afraid, as the court will need to call you as witnesses. Uh, in the meantime, I suggest that you put this place and all its associations right out of your minds. Nonsense, officer. I shall continue to attend the ceremonies. I'm afraid there will be no ceremonies. No ceremonies. What shall I do? I'm sorry, Miss Wade. See. Now, come along, Ernestine. I'll see you home. Oh, yes, Dagmar. Good night. Officer, now come along. Take my arm. Thank you, here. Inspector. And I'm sure my car would like to thank you as well. I understand. I shall always blame myself. I introduced her to this place. I am responsible. No, monsieur. Only one man is responsible for your car's death, and he will be made to pay for it. But before heaven, I am the guilty one. I will always feel it. Good night. Morris and I will see you home, Raoul, won't we? Yes, darling. If you say so. Good night, then. Good, Good night. night. Well... Oh? What do you two want? Oh, we just want to say how simply marvellous we think you've been. Yes, wonderful. Oh, Mr. Ogden. Oh, so vulgar. Well, I can't say that I exactly encourage hero worship, but we do. Oh, yes, we do. You don't think we could have a photograph? Well, you'll have to cut one out of Mr. Bathgate's beastly newspaper. Ah, oh, but they make you look so awful. Oh, I, I really am rather awful, but Mr. Bathgate will see what his press photographer can do, won't you, Bathgate? Vanity of vanity. I know one preacher who's not going to say that for some time. Good night, the pair of you. Good, Good night, night, Inspector. Well... So, after the storm... Come the calm revelations. I feared as much. What do you want to know? Everything I don't know already. Uh, what made you first suspect Ogden? His position. His what? His placing when the cup was handed round. He was the last person to handle it before it was returned to the priest and Cara drank it. Uh -huh. Would have been too risky for any of the others to have dropped the poison in the chalice. Well, Ogden took a risk as well. Yes, and it nearly came off. Then there was an extremely intelligent remark that you made that Sunday evening. Uh, which one was that? Well, you said that Ogden's American ease was too good to be true, and it was. We said, good -o. I smelt a rat, and I followed up a hunch. Oh, cliché, thy name is Alley. Well, yes, it is a question of style. You see, good -o is essentially Australian, and Ogden's style was altogether much too large. I suspected he was acting a part, and my cable to Australia proved me correct. What about the book? Well, Ogden planted it by giving it to Master Claude, along with the pornographic classics. I thought at the time it was a bit too obvious for Gone to have left it lying around. That's it. He'd done the murder. I think that Ogden got the idea of trying to pin the blame on the priest that night at the party when Ravine accidentally drew attention to the poison book. Likewise, the disappearance of the bonds. Only Garnet kept the key. He didn't know that Ogden already had an impression made of it. And so the evidence would naturally be against him. Then the bonds weren't the real motive. They were only part of it. Ogden was in for a far bigger stake than 5,000 pounds. Uh -huh. He knew that Cara was leaving almost her entire fortune to the Sacred Flame Limited. And he was the biggest shareholder. There was a lot of money. I think the idea was born as soon as he knew about the changed will. And Cara's discovery of him with the bonds clinched matters for last Sunday. And most of that's dangerous conjecture. What other facts are there? Well, only Garnet or Ogden could have concocted a local brew of cyanide at their own homes. If you discount Miss Jenkins and her gas ring, none of the others had access to a kitchen. Elsie pointed out Ogden's broken cooking pot and noticed the chewed-up poker. Poker? That's where he got his iron filing. Oh. I mean, he wouldn't have wanted to have gone to the chemist. We could too easily check on a thing like that. Yeah. Then there's the letter Cara wrote to her friend, the Comtesse de Barsac. You got it? Well, I haven't, but the French police have. Because the Comtesse was in hospital, she didn't open the letter. It as good as tells the whole story about Ogden and the bond and threatening to stop the supply of drugs. All in all, it's a pretty straightforward case. <laughs> it might seem so now, but it didn't at the beginning. Garnet's legacy. Will he still get all Miss Quain's fortune? Not if Mr. Rattlesman can help it. 
I suspect a remote French cousin might find himself a very wealthy young man. Mm, let's hope so. Garnet's the nastiest sample of the two, in my opinion. Maybe, but at least he stopped short of murder. Yeah. What'll happen to this place? The House of the Sacred Flame. This? Oh, it'll close. But there'll be other places like it before long. Tonight, we slam the door on this particular bit of hocus-pocus. But you can be sure that tomorrow, somebody else will start a new quack sideshow for the credulous. Death and Ecstasy by Niall Marsh was adapted for radio by John Tiedemann. Peter Howell played the part of Chief Detective Inspector Elaine and Gary Watson that of...